we'll move on to round 14 and we've got one of the real league winners this year but before i do guys just remember to like and subscribe really huge for us leave a comment and tell us about which of these players you loved Jamal Williams, Matt Ryan, Wondell Robinson, Jarvis Landry, David Njoku, Robbie Anderson, Gerald Everett, Zamir White, Robert Tonyan, Alec Pierce, Jameson Williams, and Daniel Jones. You can see it in the advance rates there. Jamal Williams absolutely propelled you into the fantasy playoffs. And in terms of fantasy points over expected, this was a round when you parallel it with round 13, where we had four or five players who were above expected this was a lot of negatives and there were a lot of players who weren't consistently performing jamal williams we've got to start with him 17 touchdowns 62 yards per game which was 18th 144th in russian epa but the reason you love jamal williams were all those touchdowns he was the rb12 in half ppr total points and 44.8 percent of his points came from touchdowns you can see on this graphic here the red is what percentage of those points that he scored each week were just purely from touchdowns alone. I mean, Jamal Williams is somebody that was a priority free agent for the Lions going back a couple of years when they signed him. If you watched Hard Knocks over the summer, you definitely picked up on the fact that the team didn't really like, seem to like DeAndre Swift too much at times and didn't want to give him everything. Do you think that in hindsight, Jamal Williams probably should have been a little bit higher and DeAndre Swift a little bit lower? 100% agree that, that that should have been the case. Um, it, it, we talk about you can't predict injury, but DeAndre Swift is perpetually injured, right? That man lives on the questionable radar every single week. Um, and that doesn't mean that he's less talented for being injured. No, that is not, not the case. But if you're missing games, then, you you know, the best ability is availability, right? So how I feel about Jamal Williams, though, and I think this is one of those that, yeah, right, he should have been drafted higher. He should have been a round 10 guy, right? He should have been up there. He could have been in the Ramondre Stevenson's talk. A little, little, bit, little bit, like, right before, like, right after Ramondre Stevenson should have been guys like Jamal Williams, right? We should have been taking him because we know that Swift has the possibility of being hurt. We know that Williams is a coach's guy, and I talk about this. Coaches players are are so invaluable. It doesn't matter if you're good. It does not matter. If you're a coach guy and the coach likes you, you're going to be in. You could be the worst player in the league. We've seen it. We've seen it time and time again, right? Jamal Williams is a coach guy. You know, the the off-season TV show that had for, you know, Hard Knocks showed he was a coach's guy. The, the coach literally left and was like, Jamal, talk to him. <laughs> right? <laughs> he's, yeah. And here's the thing. The Packers loved him. The Packers yeah. loved him as a pass blocker. He just sure he didn't get to keep his job there, but the Lions signed him. Your competition, your main competitor in your division signed your guy saying that we believe he's good. And he did do well. This is, you know, he's been there for a couple of years now, and both well, second year now, and he's showing that he's a leader. He's showing that he can run that office. He's showing that he's still a great pass blocker. That's what he was known for. And to top it off, he's the hard nose up the middle guy. He's not swift. So if they're yeah. on goal line, which happens way more often than we like to admit. Uh, you know, first in goal, who's getting the ball? Swift or Williams? Second in goal, who's getting the ball? For you know, Swift or what? It's gonna be Williams almost every single time. And you're just buying touchdowns. Uh 17 touchdowns, sure, we can't predict that portion, but would you have been surprised if he got eight touchdowns this year? No, and and just picking up what you said there, I think particularly with Dan Campbell and this team of you know all the coaches in Detroit pretty much are ex-players. So being a player, like like you mentioned, that a player's player and a coach's player, I think that really matters there. But yeah, 17 touchdowns. I mean, Jamal Williams has scored 30 total touchdowns across his career. So over 50% of them came this year alone. So True. I don't think we should feel too bad about not seeing 17. But yeah, it definitely seemed in his realm of possibilities for eight to ten, and perhaps he should have been going a couple of rounds earlier. I think One he could have gone a little earlier for sure. And um, like I said, he still is a pass catcher. He still is doing some work. His career last year wasn't bad either. It was still about eight hundred scrimmage yards and a couple of touchdowns. Um, so sure it wasn't eight, but that was his first year in Detroit. So and he didn't even play all his games. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that he is doing as well as he did. Yeah. Another player who a lot of people had high hopes for was Matt Ryan, who had a change of team for, you know, first time in it, you know, 
whatever, however many years. And it seemed like things were going to be set up for him to succeed, but instead it never played out that way. The offensive line, which was one of the major big stalwarts of the Colts and had been keeping that team looking great when they've had this various different quarterbacks in, heavily regressed. And Ryan really just didn't seem to have anything more to give. So we were... You know, we were coming into this on the back of a year where he'd looked pretty mediocre for the Falcons, and I believe they were dead last in offensive DVOA, and it was the first team that had ever won like eight games or so, but still been dead last in DVOA. Should we possibly have read some of these signs and thought, okay, well, if the situation devolves slightly in Indy and things aren't completely perfect, is Matt Ryan's ceiling really, really low? Because that's definitely what it feels like in hindsight i wrote an article numerous articles about matt ryan and michael Pittman this year and i made a bunch of tweets about it. i i kind of sounded very pessimistic towards the colts um and this is the thing i said uh, Quentin nelson is probably the most legendary cult that we have right now and because he's so good that he apparently everyone thought that the rest of that line was good that line hasn't been good since even when carson Wentz was there I think they were bottom of pass block and a mediocre run block uh, off offensive line. This wasn't something that we had to know. They took a left tackle that tore his ACL from the Chiefs last year, you know, Eric Fisher, and he went over there and he, and he didn't do anything. So I don't know why people were surprised coming into the season. It just kind of just showed that, um, that Quentin Nelson was so good that everyone believed that the line was good. I asked everyone this year, like, can you name an offensive lineman on that team right now that isn't Quentin Nelson? Right, like no, the answer is no. You can't because it's not actually good. Um, so that tells you one thing. So that line has been bad for two years now. So not just one. And then you, Carson Wentz had to run for his life when he was there the year before. So what does that mean for Matt Ryan? Matt Ryan's way less, way, way less mobile, much older, less fearless coming up the middle to take a hit. Um, I, I think this, the writing was on the wall coming into the season. He, the Falcons let him go. Not because you know they didn't want to win games anymore. They just don't think they could. This this you got to move on. This is Big Ben 2.0. And unlike the Steelers, they said we're going to move on. We're not going to tread wheels here. So uh, I don't think it was disappointing if you if you caught the science. I think everyone did. You know, people love Michael Pittman, but Michael Pittman is a one B two A at best. Um, he's not a playmaker. He's not taking you know four, you know ten yard catch for ninety yards. His highlights are short routes and, and a high point, right? That's that's great. So I, I don't know. I just I think Matt Ryan here should have been way below. I think ADP got it incorrect. There's no upside of this guy. There was no games where you could look at on every week to week basis where you said Matt Ryan's throwing me three touchdowns at 300 yards. That's how yeah. the Colts win football. Like no, no, there was no, nothing in their their DNA to do that this year. Yeah, it was. It was definitely rough, and I think the kind of lesson here is for me that these aren't the kind of quarterbacks to build two ta- two quarterback teams around. You know, you could have Joe Burrow, you could have Patrick Mahomes, but if you're in a spell where you need your second quarterback to give you usable weeks and you've got somebody on the back end of a career like Matt Ryan, that needs to be a three quarterback build. Um, moving on to another position that's a onesie, the tight ends. There were three of them in this round. And again, a kind of a similar theme, David and Joku, Gerald Everett, Robert Tonyan, got the tight end 12, 18 and 29. And this was an area where people were taking shots at tight end. You know, you start filling out your roster a little bit and it's like, Oh, well, I need to get one now because it's probably a little bit of a tear break soon. And I just think this really encapsulates the tight end position quite well. All of these players were similarly efficient, 1.8 fantasy points per touch for Njoku and Everett, 1.6 for Tonyan. But the range of their outcomes was huge with 17 different point places between them and like almost three points per game difference. Do you think these are the kind of tight ends that Obviously, Njoku played well and Robert Tonyan regressed a bit from his best year a couple of years ago. But in this range, if you're taking a tight end, do you need to be building with three? Or do you think some of these guys are okay in elite builds if you've got Travis Kelsey? I think you have to build a three. 
Um, Kelsey being the exception. I think Kelsey is the only tight end in fantasy history where I could say that, you know, I could think of off the top of my head that you could run with him solo every year, right? Or, or, or a, a, a secondary lower end guy. Um, you have to have three, I think, even with some of the more upper side. Like, think about this year Mark Andrews, uh, Talis Goddard, Don Schultz, Kyle Pitts. All those guys would have, TJ Hawkinson would have all benefited you if you had three guys, right? Um, so the Joku draw Everett Robert Tunyon, I I think they were priced well. I think they were correct to be drafted. You you base them on situation. You base it on on the team they were on, and all three of these guys were in funny enough three different type of situations, but they added to the same idea. Well, David Njoku is probably the only weapon left on that team besides Amari Cooper. You know, Gerald Everett is playing with the elite quarterback that will probably get him onesies and twosies. Well, Robert Tunyon. Is the most veteran guy on his team that's left. Like they all had the best with the MVP <laughs> level quarterback. So all the narratives fit. And obviously they gave you different outcomes, but I don't think you can sit there and go back and say that that was wrong. Yeah. I think that's, that's where they, what, what they ended up doing, sure, that results orientated, right? But the logic made sense for these guys. I would happily have taken two of these three guys constantly. I'm not a ton of you guys, just never have been. I don't think Aaron Rodgers targets as tight end as much as I love, but you're talking about Everett. Joku and you throw in whoever fans or Bellinger or whatever you want to throw down the road. Like I'm, I'm happy with it. I'll go with it. Yeah, very much. I think Tonyan's one of those where the writing was on the wall that you know this is a guy who had incredible touchdown luck a few years back, and then you know multiple injuries, and he just isn't what people would like him to be. Whereas Joku and Everett seem to have at least a bit more athletic ability, and I'd rather bet on that than that kind of, you know, touchdown-based volume. Uh, a player who has seen a lot of volume for his career, Jarvis Landry, ended up as the wide receiver 91, in 5.3 points per game, missed eight games. He was 83, 83rd in targets per game, and now he's a pending free agent again this offseason. Did you have high hopes for Jarvis Landry going into this season? I had zero hopes for Jarvis Landry coming to the season. As a Dolphins fan, I love him. I will always have so much love for Jarvis Landry, but from a best boss perspective, right? He is absolutely the guy you don't want to draft. Uh, for a long time, they used to call the, the franchise quarterback tier level, the Andy Dalton line. I called the best ball level, the Jarvis Landry line. <laughs> is Jarvis Landry relevant to you in best ball on any team that wasn't the Dolphins? And the answer, most of the times it's, it's a no, right? It's, he requires someone to get hurt. Um, he's at best going six receptions for 60 yards and zero touchdowns, which equivalates an underdog to nine points, which equivalates to 12 points in DraftKings. And that's his per game situation every week. So he's you're drafting him in what, round 14? To get a guy that will contribute you zero games. He contributed one game and that was in week one. After that, he did nothing for you. So that was probably, this is, Probably one of the overbites. And to top it off, he's 30 now. He's a 30-year-old slot receiver that can't stay healthy. What, yep. what, what are we buying him for? Exactly. I mean, it, it just feels in best ball, yes, you want usable weeks, and yes, you want players who are going to catch the ball, but give me the likes of Christian Watson or somebody like that, somebody explosive who isn't just going to catch the ball and give you – some points that week. Give me yeah. week winning weeks every time. I you just, need contribution yeah. weeks. And if he's not contributing, his score might as well be zero. Um, <laughs> his competition was better than him. Michael Thomas, Alfred Kamara, Taysom Hill, uh, Chris Olave, all those guys. Even Marcus Callaway would had more would have been more beneficial from a fantasy standpoint coming into the season than Jarvis Landry. And this is why I love highlighting him and I call it the Landry line. Because he, in best ball, he is extremely non-relevant.